thank you, Beatrice, for the kind introduction. And I'm so excited to be in London and be here and with a wonderful list of speakers. I'm really happy to also um, following Hank's Water Ambassador's talk. And I'll be talking about another project actually set in context of um, Asia. And my title is Between Land and Water. Um, so Between Land and Water is an ongoing research project that investigate undesigned environmental and social effect caused by increasing anthropogenic land water separation. Um, the project set in the context of Southeast Asia, where a lot of people associate with images like these, really beautiful extensive coastlines where some of the world's most cultural and biodiversity can be found. Where these coastlines are also going through or have gone through um, rapid yet uneven transformations, particularly coastal hardening projects such as sea wars, um, dredging, land reclamation, and so on and so forth, that replace once a porous coastline um, to a rigid um, separation between land and water. The project began as a self-initiated um, research, research collective between myself and Seacoast um, that stands for Cent Center for Southeast Asian Coast Interactions based in University of California, Santa Cruz. It's led by anthropologists um, Anna Singh and Megan Thomas, and the collective consists of a group of PhD candidates as well as an extended network of scientists in Southeast Asia. So my work through narrative-based spatial analysis, highlighting particular socio-ecological relations and modern human histories has always been a transdisciplinary and collaborative effort. Um, drawing not only um, is a form of how I represent the research, but also the way I formalize and conduct and also make sense of the research. What we learned from our collective experiences before is that there's room and needs for the exchange of knowledge, perspectives, and skill sets between architects and scientists. Um, scientists not often uh, require critical analysis of visual forms, but might lack necessary tools and techniques, whereas um, anthropological and scientific research can offer architects like us um, alternative ways of thinking of design decisions that sometimes um, you know, focus or even prioritize environmental justice. So for me, um, visual analysis can serve as an analytical tool that reveal hidden ecological and social effects um, going beyond mere trans, um, representations, but also open up to new questions that might lead to new research directions. So this is a project which is self-initiated research experiment, and we didn't have any funding to begin with. So working around the limitations, um, what's quite interesting to me is external supports from cultural institutions, such as commissions and grants, play the key role in the way the projects kind of unravel itself. So in a way, it became an unrestricted, constantly evolving, expanding project, um, which each analysis, which you will see later, um, as a reflection of the work I produced before. In late 2020, I was commissioned by um, curator Philippa Ramos to contribute a visual essay for the 2020 edition of Vito Nora, um, Form of the Future. And using this opportunity, I created Flowing Toxins, uh, my first Seacoast collaboration with anthropologist Kirsten Keller, who just returned from her field-based research in Jakarta not long before we started this um, collaboration. So working with her fresh materials brought back from Jakarta, including photographs, interviews, conversations, and data, the drawing making process become way more than translating the research, but also just figure out what the research was to begin with. So I will talk through the visual essay by pairing crops of the drawing with colors photographs. A fishing village called Mora Anka, um, the red area here on the map, also depicted here, is one of the coastal marginal lands in Jakarta, which traditional fisher persons inhabit with informal land rights, making them vulnerable to eviction and make way for formal property development. The hatched area here indicates um, the self-built, um, semi-permanent stilt architecture, and um, the double hatched area is um, where the green mussel fisher persons are scattered. 
Shown here is a map of Jakarta Bay with its intertwined waterway extending to the inner city. Um, unfettered dumping of wastewater mostly come from domestic sewage, industrial effluent, and agricultural runoffs flow into a nutrient-rich, heavy metal-laden soup through um, small water channels flow into larger rivers uh, eventually drain into the bay. Meanwhile, poor, poor solid waste management lead to a large amount of garbage piling up in the rivers, also at peripheries of informal settlements. Um, polluted surface water and unreliable sewage um, cause extensive private drilling for groundwater, which in turn causing um, land substance, which um, Hank has mentioned. So the city is sinking into the sea. Massive coastal protection infrastructures have been implemented to protect the city from further substance. However, the um, offshore seawall, which is the thick black line, as you can see from the drawing, and also the, sorry, the offshore seawall, which is the thick white line, and the onshore seawall, which is the thick black line, essentially enclose J uh, Jakarta Bay and trapping contaminated water um, into a giant lagoon and um, destroying the marine ecology, which has already hap been happening. In the last 40 years, um, infrastructure and wastewater have diminished um, fishing, which is essential livelihood practices for local fish persons. However, the Asian green mussel provided a hardier alternative for many. As field feeders, they consume um, suspended particles in water columns um, and um, feeding on excess nutrients, toxic algae, and heavy metal. They do not survive but only thrive in these toxic environments. So the diagram here shows um, the cultivation of green mussels using bamboo structure driven into shallow waters. Um, and this has become um, one of the main source of income for many. But as um, the fisher persons um, cultivate, shark can eat the mussels, they're also exposed to the toxins that mussels have absorbed. absorbed. Um, our bodies become one of the hosts for these flowing toxins. And these are some photographs to show you the processes of cultivation and processing. So then what happened to the vast quantity of shells um, generated from the mussel processing? Well, other other than being discarded, they're actually being used by some fishermen um, as reclamation materials to create new informal lands as a way to claim their land ownership through forming new boundaries between land and water. In January 2022, Indonesia's parliament officially announced the decision to move its capital from Jakarta to a newly formed city at East Kalimantan, Borneo Island, because of the land substance. In coastal regions, when land meets the water, the threshold is constantly shifting. But as the interface is increasingly hardened by coastal infrastructures, the amphibious ecologies are being transformed too, but not in uniform ways and timelines. How to best represent the uneven transformations? That was a question I asked myself when I was commissioned by Eflux Architecture and 2022 um, Bien uh, Architecture Biennial to contribute an essay for their digestion series. This time, I worked with anthropologist Seacoast member um, Zahira Suhaimi and Olan Salita photographer and fisherman Jeffrey Salim to create an animated um, illustration series that tried to tell how these constructed shifts in porosity can turn um, a birth ground for many amphibious ecologies into a toxic, toxic zone. So the illustration was based um, on Suhaimi's extended research in um, Johor Strait, which you can see as um, drawn in as black line, is a long and um, narrow passage water that divides Singapore from Malaysia. As well as Salim's photographs of his village um, of the Olan Salitas, who are the indigenous people of Johor Strait. And I'm going to flick through um, some of his photographs. So combining all these elements together, the animated illustration has become an experiment in collective storytelling of landscape histories. And then I will be telling, explaining the drawing through telling you a story. 
Legend has it, in Johor's history, it rained for a whole month, nonstop. As much as land was submerged, many tribes of Onan Asli moved to boats to avoid animals like tigers and crocodiles on the mountaintops. When the tide retreated, Olan Salita settled around the river. According to various folk tales, Olan Salita culture was nurtured by rich amphibious ecosystems, primarily mangroves. The dynamics of porosity shifted when plantation reshaped the landscape of Johor. During the mid 19th century, Gambia plantation quickly came to dominate the Strait's near water region, growing partnership with pepper, replacing mangroves. These are where the Gambian plantation are located by the colonial plantation owners. The Gambian extraction process required boiling its leaves, and the planters turned to mangrove trees as resources for firewood and charcoal. Global demand has boomed this extremely exhausting cultivation process, which turns land to wasteland only within 20 years. With the disappearance of mangrove forests as multi-species shelter and nursery, the Olan Salitas were forced to seek livelihood elsewhere. Prostis today has become toxic and dangerous. The construction of the new highway facilitates new coastal infrastructure projects, such as land reclamation, dams, and seawalls, which block exchange, uh, water exchange in some places while extirpating the mixing of chemicals and physical dumps in others. With the intensification of industrial fishing and muscle cultivation, the Olan Salita find it hard um, to maintain their traditional livelihood practices, such as fishing, hunting, and foraging. With limited access, they largely rely on local Chinese and Malay middlemen to sell their daily catches. In this extractive landscape, both human and non-human struggle to adapt to this constantly shifting porosity. Rights to land and water in coastal regions have always been a more than human battle, such as the Olan Salitas who are facing eviction um, and the planned relocation of their entire village. What you're seeing here is a video I took um, during my last visit um, when Jeffrey Salim, um, our collaborator, was showing us around his village during my last field trip, also my first seacoast study trip just last summer, um, thanks to the support from Graham Foundation and um, Social Science Research Council. So what if the ownership of the land was formed before the land even existed? And in the process of formation, that with the erasure of all traces from the past, what kind of undesigned environmental effect will emerge and proliferate? This was the question that emerged during my field trip in Singapore, where 20% of the landmass sits on reclaimed land. Um, and actually, majority of these reclamation effort occurs during um, the past few decades. During my visits, I met with environmental chemist Gonzalo Carrasco from Nanyang Technological University, who is also an extended um, network member of Seacoast, and accompanied him and his crew on two sampling expeditions along Singapore's um, south and east coast. We tracked four heavy metal um, pollutants from the seawater samplings, zinc, copper, cadmium, lead, as well as natural organic matter that prevents the metal from bioaccumulating and unnatural organic matter that produced from industrial activities. The, dis uh, the distribution of the pollutant metal sorry, um, can be used to assess the repercussions of the recent industrial and residential activities, particularly on the um, oceanic ecosystems. For example, copper, an element primarily connects with its use of herbicides in lawns and um, in residential areas, is observed on this highlighted area that we identify as East Coast. Around 15 hectares of land was reclaimed during, um, since 1966 for residential um, development. And here, identified as West Coast, is the world's second largest um, commercial port, um, where zinc was produced as um, ship body sacrificial anodes to prevent the ship from rusting. Jurong Island, a reclaimed island on the southwest tip, um, is um, of it, uh, mostly used for oil refinery industries, which um, produce a lot of petroleum-related unnatural organic matter. Finally, Tuas, um, also a reclaimed peninsula, um, occupied mostly for chemical plants that produce a number of um, trace metals, such as zinc, cadmium, and copper. 
So what you've seen here is um, part of my new digital interactive project um, in collaboration with Carrasco titled Before There Was Land, There Were Mangroves, commissioned by Diria Biennial that opened just um, last month in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so working from sampling discoveries, I created a series of mapping illustrations um, that try to capture the chemical impact of um, our recent industrial and um, urban transformations of South, um, Singapore's coastline since 1846 to now. Um, so this project is trying to review that transformation through capturing the bioaccumulation of metals and unnatural organic matter. And that was not only caused by the hardening project, but at the th same time, the loss of natural um, uh, ecology, such as mangroves, mudflats, um, swamps, and so on and so forth. So what's very interesting to learn from um, an environmental chemist is actually the natural organic matter helped to wrap around metal and flush it out um, through natural streams and essential exchange. And what happened now is the solid and rigid coastline built by cement and rock cuts off this essential exchange. Um, this is also a lesson learned for us that um, there's many kind of reforestation <laughs> efforts for mangroves that wouldn't work because we lack of this e essential exchange. So with my um, upcoming field trips in Indonesia and possibly other places, um, the project will continue to evolve in many forms. Cross-disciplinary collaboration and field-based knowledge has always been essential to my research, and I intend to continue to contribute to um, new conversations and also um, collaborative and collective narrative speaking about the natural uh, built environment, um, which extend um, beyond discipline boundaries. Thank you. <laughs>